Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Governor Cuomo took the next step of his clemency initiative last week by granting 100 conditional pardons to youthful offenders, 12 clemencies, and five pardons to adults. One of those when receiving clemency is my friend Judith Clark. Joining me today are the investigative reporter Tom Robbins, who wrote her story in the New York Times Magazine, and her attorney, CUNY Law School professor Steve Zeidman. Welcome to both of you. Glad to be that here. That was quite something that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't know if people quite understand the awesome power that most governors have and how little it's been used over the years but how effective it could be if it's used. I think some governors don't understand the awesome power I, I, that no, they I have. I know, I agree, yeah. And Andrew Cuomo did something here that uh, he's been building upon for the last couple of years, and he took a step beyond where even President Obama, who's gotten a lot of rightful mm -hmm. credit for his number, but he included people who've been convicted of violent crimes this time, right. including Judy Clark. Right, that is a major thing, isn't it? It is a major thing, and there are Obviously, there are governors who may not be fully aware of the power they have, but there are certainly more who probably know it but are afraid of wielding it. So and this is courageous. Yeah. It, it's it raises commendable. that problem of we all, where everybody throws around the term mass incarceration. We all know we've got too many people in prison, right? And we know that people are in prison for other than drug use mm -hmm. or selling, because that's basically what's the the bulk of the people who've been. Released. Well, the, I think part of the misperception has been to the public in this debate has been the assumption that drug dealing does not include violence. Yeah. Almost all of those crimes include some element of violence to them. Frequently, the crime to which people end up being convicted does not include a violent count, but that the uh, yeah. underlying That's issues. So, yeah, that are, along with it is a murder or something else. Right. Yeah. So, um, what do you think made Governor Cuomo start this? The initiative that he began about a year ago, yeah. which really is, it's unprecedented, the idea that we're going to take clemency seriously, we're going to assign pro bono lawyers for people who want to apply for clemency, and to me it's a recognition, it's probably the first national recognition that if we are going to deal with mass incarceration, we have to decarcerate. Mm -hmm. it's, we can talk about changing mandatory minimums and who we prosecute and what the sentences are, but we have a, a current problem. And the only way to address that is to look hard at the parole system and to look hard at clemency. Do we keep people in prison longer than other countries? Oh, unquestionably. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we have more than, we have more people in prison than, than almost one country, I think, has it, no? Or more. We have more people in prison than China has. We are the world's the jailer, league. that's for sure. Right. And then the way we treat them is also so different. I remember the trip, you know, to Germany that they, that, um, they took some, the head of John Jay. Right. And, and from Vera. Right. I mean, that was astonishing when they came back with their report of the different programs because the purpose of prison, what is the purpose of prison? Well, de <laughs> it, depending who you speak to, but ultimately it should be, it's corrections. It's about rehabilitation. Right. It's about can we help somebody get to a place where they need to be to be, you know, the, the catchphrase is a productive member of society. But it's more that can they kind of realize their own personal growth? And to do that, we have to have the right kind of programs, the right kind of attention to it and we certainly don't give it the sort of support mm. that it needs. I'm the correction officers in Germany, I think, are trained for yeah. three years or something like yes. that. Yes, yeah. it's a very different system. Right. So if you try to explain that to average people, they think, oh, you're just soft on all of this. But the point of putting some, I mean, obviously there are some people who will never be able to change the way they think or, or, or do. I mean, they're a threat, but there are other people I mean, the purpose was to let them have the time to really come to terms. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the ideal. Yeah. And, and I think prison waiting rooms are full of people who felt previously about lock them up and throw the key away up until the point when someone in their family became convicted mm. of a crime and they realized that, like, this is a person who like, did something wrong but who deserves a second chance. Do you know uh, people who are in prison whose families are in law enforcement? Yes. And what, does it change their attitude? 
I, it certainly mellows their attitude, no question. Uh, yeah. You know, I think that there are, there, I've met quite a few folks who talk about uncles who were on the force who, or who had some role in law enforcement or uh, other relatives who like now say like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I would go to bat for you, I would go to bat for somebody who had actually done what you've done, talking mm -hmm. about someone who had actually rehabilitated themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you have, you have a clinic at, at CUNY Law School? Yes. So that means you represent other people? We represent other people seeking clemency, people who are in the parole process, uh, folks at the trial level. But it's, it's sort of a, you know, uh, kind of emblematic of what CUNY Law School is about. Yeah. You know, yeah. a school about social justice. Yeah. And the other part of the governor's initiative was to post in the prisons that we have a process now, right? Mm -hmm. that you can apply and we will give you, we will assign the pro bono attorneys? Exactly, and what was great about that is it was a recognition from the governor's office that there were a lot of deserving people and that maybe they weren't getting the full picture of why that person was deserving. So it was mm -hmm. a way of saying, you know, if you want to apply for clemency, if you meet kind of a, a real minimal threshold of requirements, uh, check a box and we have pro bono lawyers throughout the state who will kind of help you comp compile your records, put your best foot forward so we can determine if you're someone who should um, be out. Does New York State now separate people under 16 and under? Separate? From the adult prisons? They do. Right. And, and the, the conditional pardons were given to 100 young people or who were young when they were arrested? Correct. And who have not been rearrested? That's right. And it's conditional because as soon as they mm -hmm. offend, the pardon goes away. Way. Judy Clark uh -huh. is the prime example of wh why we have pardons and clemencies, right? I think that's right. You know, I, I came to think that way. You know, I, I'm not sure I always thought so because, yeah. as I've said before to you and you know, on this show, is that I, I knew Judy before the crime and after she was part of this crazy ragtag crew of radicals who did this despicable act back in October of 1981. I wanted nothing to do with her. The, the idea that somebody that I could be friends with could be so heedless of human life to be even part of a action that resulted in three innocent men dying mm -hmm. was unthinkable to me. Mm -hmm. And even though Judy had been a good friend, she was a high school sweetheart of my best friend. And I, I didn't want anything to do with her for over 25 years. So what made you go up there to meet her? People who did go to see Judy kept telling me she really has changed and you should go and see what she's doing and talk to her. And so I did. And it took a, a few trips up there. It didn't happen all at once because I was skeptical. You know, I mean, I knew Judy was brilliant. I knew that, like, she had a great winning smile and that she was capable of being when she wanted to be, you know, very persuasive. Uh, but when she told me and described her own course of change and her enormous remorse, I mean, I, I'll say this, I'm not sure everybody in the audience sort of, you know, is familiar with the, the crew that she ran with, but she's the only one that I know of who has ever really come to terms and apologized for the actions that she did. Judy consciously stopped calling herself a political prisoner years ago, even though that inside prison gives you a certain pecking order and people say, oh, look at, you know, this someone's a political prisoner. She said, no. She said, my motivations were political, but my actions were criminal. And she's lived with those consequences. I found all of that convincing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could add, too, when I spoke to Judy about the governor's grant of clemency, you know, obviously she was joyful, um, grateful, incredibly grateful, hopeful. But what she added was that she also recognized that this, the amount of joy that she was experiencing, she understood well that the announcement was going to cause a lot of, a lot of pain to the families of those who suffered, you know, who lost loved ones back in 1981. And to me, that's, that's so typical of the sort of person mm. that Judy is. She carries this with her every day. She's also a chaplain now, right? That was not put in many of the articles. That's correct. It's interesting. Uh, I guess that started with the release or something, I don't, I don't know what, what it was, but um, the, the, the people who've been affected by that act, uh, what, what is it that motivates them? I shouldn't use them as an example. Mm -hmm. What motivates the people who are opposed to her getting out? I can speak specifically to Judy's crime, mm -hmm. was that you know Rockland County was a pretty peaceful place. 
and this was the worst thing that had happened mm. there probably then or since. And people, when I went to talk to them about the impact on the community, some of them referred to it as this was our 9-11, before 9-11. You know, there is a very moving memorial right there at the junction where the deaths of the two police officers, Edward O'Grady and Waverly Brown, took place. And, and it it's something they commemorate mall, right? every year. In a well, the, in the initial robbery took yeah. place at a mall in Nanuet, but then the fatal shoot, and that's where the mm -hmm. security guard, Peter Page, mm -hmm. was killed. And then the truck was stopped at the throughway, and that's where the two police mm -hmm. officers were killed. And so, you know, it's something that's really strong in their community. And it, it, it's something that, you know, some people live with constantly, not just family members, but community members. So the idea of like, you know, wanting any kind of leniency for the people who brought that kind of terror to their community is very hard to get over. So but I would say that I also talked to people who were from Nyack and Steve has worked for some others who've been there. There was a meeting just about a month and a half ago mm -hmm. up there of a lot of Nyack residents talking about forgiveness. And that's really a characteristic of the general population, right? I, I when it comes to so. discussing prisons. The idea of forgiveness or that, and it's also, what I think is important is, and I think a lot, um, a lot of people are recognizing this. I mean, there has been punishment. You know, when the governor referred to that this wasn't a slap on the wrist, meaning she served 35 years. So there has been punishment, and for, for Judy Clark in particular, but for a lot of other people who are, who want to be considered for clemency or frankly who come up for parole, they've served decades. So the question is really how much punishment is enough? And for a lot of people we begin to feel, and I'm speaking for myself now, that at some point punishment, the desire to punishment moves almost, the dial moves to a place of just this unrelenting thirst for vengeance, mm -hmm. which on some level I can understand, but that's what really frames the debate. When is it enough? When has somebody been punished enough? Mm -hmm. When you look around, and even in the honor cells, I mean, the, the building that has the uh, uh, pet, the dog trainers, mm -hmm. and they're sort of semi-special, uh, they have cells, you know? They've got a nice, a larger room, it's, and it's got a window, um, but they're locked in in the gate at night. It's still, a, you know, it's... It's prison. Yeah, and, it's and that's prison. where Judy is, Bedford Hills, is a maximum security prison. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I always want... I used to go up there a lot, uh, or there but for the grace of God goes I. You know? mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about the next step, because sure. Judy got clemency. How is that different from a pardon? Well, the clemency, what the governor did is he commuted her sentence, which is a form of clemency. Mm -hmm. So her original sentence of 75 to life meant she would, was eligible for parole in 2056, mm -hmm. when she would have been over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. And the governor taking a very long a careful look through his executive clemency bureau, looking at the remarkable achievements that Judy was able, the things she was able to accomplish even within the confines of a prison, Ronnie, as you describe it. All these reasons led the governor to think, you know what, I'm gonna commute your sentence such that you are now eligible for parole. And it's almost as if he took 40 years off that minimum to say you've been punished sufficiently, now let's see, I think you deserve to make your case to parole and I'm giving you that opportunity. So when you are sentenced to a term 20 years to life, you're not eligible for parole till you've served 20 years? Till you do your minimum, that's correct. I see. So then it's 30, so she got commuted to 37 and a half years or whatever. Essentially, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now what's the next step? Well, the next, there'll be a parole hearing, mm -hmm. a parole interview. And what's parole? Well, well, I mean, we're talking to people who don't really, you know, Sure. This is the, it, it's really, this is the state agency that's entrusted with making decisions, I guess in this case primarily, about mm -hmm. whether or not someone should be released uh, back into society, whether they are a threat to public safety, whether they have shown evidence of rehabilitation. I mean, in Judy's case, you know, given the, you know, the way she was vetted by the governor's office, I think obviously it's an overwhelmingly powerful case. Mm -hmm. And I hope and expect that the parole board will follow the, the governor's courageous lead. But that's essentially what the parole board does. Does the parole board have a set of sta a standard, a set of questions or a set of standards that they ask about and evaluate? Uh, they do indeed. They do indeed. I mean, and obviously some of it will be specific to the individual. Mm -hmm. But they are going to ask somebody about what happened, the crime of their conviction. They're going to talk to them about what they have achieved or how they have managed uh, during the time they've been incarcerated, and they're going to talk about what is your reentry re plan? What are your goals upon release? Do you have uh, family support? Do you have ideas about where you're going to live? What kind of work you want to do? 
What kind of work does Judy want to do? Uh, Judy is very, she's very interested in working in uh, a community-based health organization mm. um, and, to, you know, giving back, I guess. And I know that sounds corny, but that's mm. all she's ever talked about. One of the things she told me that she really wants to do is she's been working, as you just referenced, with this uh, Puppies Behind Bars program. And over the last few years, she's been training dogs to be service dogs for veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan who have some form of PTSD mm. and need the comfort of a service dog. And her, she talks endlessly about her experiences of these veterans. And she says that that's one of the things she wants to do when she comes out is to continue to work with vets. That's interesting. Which is kind of remarkable given the kind of crime yeah, she that she went a, away for. So, and, and, and but her experience with these people. Against war and stuff, yeah, yeah, right. Telecommunications has changed the way parole boards meet with prisoners, right? Yes, indeed. It's, I, I'm in a, a frame of mind where I'm scared to death now of mm. the internet <laughs> and all the electronic things because yeah. it's so changed mm -hmm. some of the, the best things that we have in life. I mean, it's added other things, but what happens to someone who is going to have a parole hearing? Well, ideal world, you would expect a decision of that magnitude that people would all be in a room together. You know, we, yeah. It's the way we relate to each other. Yeah. It's the way we talk so that there's kind of a, a natural back and forth. Um, overwhelmingly, these are done by video, which makes for an artificiality, makes it very difficult for, for everybody, frankly. And you know, to me, from my perspective, that's the challenges of the parole board. There are, there are vacancies on the parole board. They're hearing an awful lot of cases, how much time they can devote to each individual case. We know from mm -hmm. an article recently that was written in the New York Times about the struggles of the parole board. I mean, hopefully, it will be fully staffed very soon. I believe they are interviewing more candidates. It's, mm. a, it's an awesome responsibility. And the question is, are people given the tools they need to do it? Mm. And are we going about it the right way for, for all concerned? And a, a prisoner is not allowed to have counsel with them. That's correct. So they're in a room alone. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at a screen. And they don't, as you said, they don't see the whole board. They just see the one person. That's right. And it's usually three people? It's usually three people, yeah. Have you ever... Well, I guess nobody's ever watched a parole. I've never been allowed to see one. No. I, I've inquired in the past. Uh, and, it's interesting. You, know, you, can, it's, you can watch you can somebody get the being transcript. killed. <laughs> right, right. But you can't watch the other we, side. We, we're allowed in the press. We're allowed to get the transcripts mm, and you know, publicize them. Yeah. But the, to actually be there and to observe, there's no right, role. Right. Mm -hmm. there, the, the, um, so the issue of clemency, the relationship of that to the population, there's another, I mean, Judy fits into several categories because she's not young. Correct. But she is a sample of someone who's so strong that she's managed to overcome what happens to many other people right. because you age a lot in mm -hmm. prison, right? Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, lots of people are talking about what is the point of keeping someone there, as you said, beyond the 15 years, 10 years, 20 years, uh, and especially if they're older right. because they're incurring more expenses Mm -hmm. How much does it cost? Well, let's always, always repeat that. Yeah, well, you hear this number, $60,000 a year, but that's, I think, That's for a standard that's prisoner. Exactly. And a, an older prisoner, it's anywhere north of $100,000 a year, and it can be more expensive than that, depending upon their condition. Mm -hmm. It's a huge amount of money, and, and New York State has had to expend huge amounts for some of the specific ailments that are throughout their prisons. Hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. is, is a real problem inside and a very, very costly program to be able to really give effective treatment to and people don't always get it. Um, Judy, w w when you were talking about what she's done inside prison, she and another person, Kathy Boudin, wrote the protocol basically, didn't they, for AIDS education in prisons? They did and that's also and something... And it's used. It, it is used nationally and what's remarkable about what Judy has been able to accomplish and it's a testament to her kind of her strength and her character is it's not only how do I take advantage of what little resources there are for me to kind of, you know, for personal growth and development, but also she somehow has managed to not only think about herself, but how can I develop protocols, programs, work with other people, uh, the, the mentoring that she's done, mm -hmm. uh, creating other, bringing college programs into uh, the prison for the benefit of other women who are there. It's truly remarkable, and I should say also, that's working with the administration. Yeah. So there's working, you know, it, it, this way of working on behalf of veterans, there's also, she's achieved a lot of this by working with prison administration and staff, mm. which is also pretty remarkable. A person in prison, it's not just that person. 
it's their family mm -hmm. and people around them. And you see the children and everything else. So it's a very difficult kind of thing. She also managed to be a very good parent she did. while she was there. Her daughter was 11 months old at the time of her crime. And her daughter Harriet has only known her throughout her childhood and now her adult as a prisoner. And through visits. And visiting her in the visitor room. She told me when I talked to her for my story, getting a new vending machine in the visiting room was like getting new furniture in our living room. You know, that was where I lived. <laughs> she said she had two living rooms, I think, or something yes. like that, right? Uh, because it became such a natural part of her upbringing. And now she's a prof she, she teaches. She's at a lecturer at Stanford. She's a, she's uh, a writer. writer and right. uh, English right. professor. So what else can we do with this mass incarceration? Well, focusing on where Judy is right now, it's a matter of, we think about clemency, but now our efforts have moved towards parole. Uh, and there is a movement afoot here in New York State, but everywhere, mm -hmm. to think a little bit harder about parole. I mean, in Judy's case, you know, one of the many reasons that she was the perfect candidate for clemency, it's not just her achievements and who she is, uh, it's, she's one of the longest serving women. I think the fourth longest serving woman in New York State Prison. She's one of the oldest women in New York Prison. So as we look at the parole system, we think about decarceration. You know, in New York State, we have over 10,000 people incarcerated who are over the age of 50. And an awful lot of these folks are eligible for parole. And I think and it's, about for, time, yeah. it's about time to ask ourselves, what's the purpose of this? Yeah. What yeah. is the purpose? Right. The other upside I just add from what Governor Cuomo has done is that he's now allowed people who are incarcerated at a place like Bedford Hills where they've seen that Judy got this mm -hmm. wonderful clemency to believe that they have a chance to mm. and that they won't solely be judged by what was probably the worst thing they ever did in their lives, but also what they did while they were paying the price for the worst thing they ever did in their lives. And that's changed the atmosphere somewhat at that place already just since the governor's announcement. And it inspires other people to do, try to follow that same kind of Absolutely. path within the prison. How many, do you know how many people have sentences longer than 75 years to life who are in? in New York State prisons? I, is I there can, anybody? There's, there are life without paroles. Yeah. There are. Yes. I'm That's not sure right. the life total with, number. Yeah. That was the excuse for not, not executing, right? right? right. There are about 10,000 people with a maximum of life on the back end of their sentence in New York State prison. We have about 10,000 people with 20 year minimums. So the sentencing, there, there's a lot to try and get your arms around. You know, and I think it's important to say, Ronnie, I just want to do have this opportunity yeah, to say, do. there. The, Mass incarceration is a national problem. And you ask that question about what, are, you know, other governors, are they aware of it? Will they wield it? Um, what Governor Cuomo did, it's commendable. It's not just the number of clemencies, but it is, as Tom pointed out. These are, there were folks like Judy who were convicted of the most serious crime there is, of murder. And if other people, if other governors would have the courage to do something like this, we could really begin to make a dent in mass incarceration. Yeah. And it was a, such a far-seeing program. Mm -hmm. to just to recruit the, the lawyers, to tell people within prison, yes, you could apply for clemency. Yes, you have a chance, we'll help mm -hmm. you. It, it, it is a remarkable program. And he's really in the forefront of it, isn't he? Very much. It's, yeah. it's, you know, in its simplest form, it's a way of saying we are going to rethink the idea of we lock you up and throw away the key. Mm -hmm. So now, when will she go to parole? We'll find that out very soon. I mean, hopefully within the next six to eight weeks. If well, not this, sooner. Yeah, this has been a... a it's a very exciting thing and a great um, result of the work that you guys have done. And it's really astonishing. And I hope that it is the path to a whole new way of treating people, you know, and bringing that population down. Let's hope. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>